there was something that I perhaps got in the mail that I already unboxed before I started this video, but let me introduce to you. Spin, 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 spin. Hello, if you'll notice, I'm wearing this super cute sweater. Hold on, my hair is in the way. This is a donor gift that I got because I became a monthly donor of Doctors Without Borders. As I previously highlighted, in some of my videos, as you may know. Honestly, I wasn't expecting to get it this quickly. The website said that I wasn't gonna get it until three months of donations, which I was like, okay, yeah, that's fine. Like, I am i don't have a problem with that. You know, they gotta make sure that people aren't just like doing the one-time donation to get the free thing and that they're actually committing to being monthly donors. So I understand. I was like, that's fine, I don't care, I'll wait. You know, good things come to those who wait. So, and look at that. It showed up in the mail. You know what didn't show up though? I was supposed to get a pre-order gift for one of the books that I ordered and one of the books that I'm gonna talk about today. And I still have yet to get it. I got this one like literally a week after I got the actual book. And now we're two weeks past the on sale date and I don't have my pre-order gift and I'm a little nervous. It was supposed to be like a print, like an art print. And I was like, oh, that would look so, so, so cute on my wall. So if I don't get it, I'm going to be a little upset, but I will understand, but I won't be happy about it. Hello and welcome back. It is a new day, a new sleigh, and a new video where I have something to say. And as you may or may not have noticed, it's okay if you didn't, I reorganized my bookshelf a little bit. We're getting an unprecedented look at this bottom bookshelf. This used to be like just my, the junk drawer of my bookshelf, if you will. I would just stick the most random stuff down here, but now it's all organized. And at first I was a little nervous because I'm like, I had my system before. It was not a great system. It, it was nothing compared to the Dewey Decimal system, but it was a system nonetheless. And then it occurred to me that my extensive manga collection, all the volumes are essentially the same size. So they all like stack perfectly next to each other. And I was like, oh my God, perfect. And then I got to this, this, this shelf right here. I'm really proud of this here, like pink coordination. I think it looks really cute. Um, the only problem that I realized because my initial goal was I was like, oh, I'm gonna like make this shelf bigger because you like these you can take out, right? and you can adjust the size. So I was like, okay, I'm gonna make this big because this is like the main focal point in the background of my videos. And then I realized you can't move this. This this one, you can't move. It's only these. Um, it's a work in progress nonetheless. And it's where we're gonna get the book that I'm going to talk about today. And I just realized that I have put it in a very precarious position on this bookshelf where I can't access it very easily. So it's right here, it's right here. Um. Ooh, this this is screaming a bad idea right now, but I am going to do it. You just okay. Oh my god, I am a god. As I mentioned in my community tab upload for the Song of Achilles, we are now in May, and May is AAPI month, which if you don't know, AAPI stands for Asian American and Pacific Islander Heritage Month. Yay! As I've done with previous months, I will be highlighting authors that identify as Asian American and or Pacific Islander and you know, just of that general um, distinction. Which again, is not to say that May is the only month that we should highlight them. We should always highlight them, but I will be sp making a specific effort this month, but that is not to say that I'll never read from these kinds of authors ever again. As we know, I've already read a lot of books from people that identify as Asian American and or Pacific Islander. So this month is just like a extra special month where we can give them extra, extra love on top of the love that we normally give them. Okay, so for this month, my sister has been begging, literally begging me to read this book. She hyped it up like from the get-go. They were like, oh, you're gonna love it so much. You like, you have to get on this right now because I think they read it January, February. It was definitely earlier in the year because we both kind of got on this like reading kick. So she read it a little bit earlier than I did. And she was like, you have to read it. Like, you're gonna love it so, so much. And she was hyping the heck out of this book. So I was like, okay, I'm, I'm like, I have it all planned out. I will get to this book eventually. I got to the book, finally arrived the time where I was gonna start the book. And well, 
Needless to say, we all have our tastes. This just might not have been mine. Oops. So without further ado, allow me to introduce to you Daughter of the Moon Goddess by Su Lin Tan. So this book was actually published in 2022, so it's been a few years, but this was Su Lin Tan's debut novel. It's a duology with uh, the first book being Daughter of the Moon Goddess and the second one being Heart of the Sun Warrior. So the general synopsis of this book is it's essentially a retelling, like a myth retelling, um, based on Chinese mythology, specifically the story of how like the sun came to be. So the story goes that there were 10 sunbirds that came to earth and essentially they like burned and scorched the earth. Humanity was on the verge of dying. But then this one archer, Ho Yi, came up and he had like a bow of ice that it was like magical, right? A, an ice bow and he shot down nine of the 10 sunbirds and left one, which is our current sun in the sky. For his actions to save humanity, the celestial emperor gave him an elixir of immortality but he did not drink it. His wife, Chang'e, instead decided to drink the elixir of immortality and become the goddess of the moon. So this story follows their daughter, AKA daughter of the moon goddess, AKA, I forgot her name, hold on. Xingyin, yes, I remember, okay. I've I've read a few books since the completion of this one, so I, 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 I'm a little rusty, but Lo and behold, I still remember all my beefs with this book. So trust you me. Anyway, so Xingyin is the daughter of the moon goddess. And at the beginning of the story, they're living together happily on the moon, right? Xingyin, her mother Chang'e, the, da the daughter, oh my god, the goddess of the moon, and her kind of like caretaker slash like just, you know, the person that is also there with them and her name is Pinga. And together they're all just kind of like chilling out on the moon, you know? The problem arises and like what kind of launches us into the next part of the story, the main part of the story is because Xingyin, you know, the, the daughter, right? She has like an affinity for magic, but her mother specifically tells her not to reach for it because like she doesn't really tell her why, but she's like, just, you know, don't, don't use your magic, right? And one day she gets kind of like bored and like she feels like that like, I don't know, tingle, <laughs> the magic tingle. And she's like, okay, yeah, I'm, I'm gonna reach for my magic. So she like reaches for it, but like nothing happens. And she's like, oh, that was like a really weird sensation, right? And then all of a sudden, unannounced, her mother comes barging into her room and she's like, oh, mom, I'm sorry. Like, I know you told me not to, blah, 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 blah. And she's like, we have bigger things to worry about. The celestial empress is coming to the moon. And she's like, whoa, 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 what is happening right now? It turns out that Chang'e, the goddess of the moon, is actually a prisoner. The moon, their palace, is a prison because again, she drank the elixir of immortality, but it wasn't meant for her. It was supposed to be for the archer Hoi Yin. So the celestial emperor punished her by, yes, she is the goddess of the moon, she's a slay, but she's also in prison and she can never ever leave. When she was sentenced to be imprisoned, she was pregnant, right? So she was immortal, pregnant with a previously mortal daughter that became immortal because she gave birth while she was immortal. Okay, okay. She's also not allowed to have any visitors. That was like part, like a stipulation of her imprisonment. So by her having a daughter and like essentially keeping it secret from the celestials, she is breaking the rules of her imprisonment. So she had been hiding Xingyin for however many years that she's been alive. But when she activated her magic for the very first time, it alerted the celestial empress that there was like an unknown magic presence on the moon. So they were like, oh, you are definitely hiding someone out here on the moon. And she was like, no, 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 no. It's just like, you know, the eclipse. <laughs> They're like, okay, fine. We can't figure out if you're lying or not, but we will come back. So Chang'e decides that she needs to send Xingyin away so that they don't find her and they don't hurt her. So the rest of the story follows Xingyin as we leave the moon and as she struggles to find a way to free her mother from her imprisonment. Okay, that's the spoiler free section of Daughter of the Moon Goddess. Now we are going to get into the spoilers. And by that, I mean, we are gonna get into why I don't like this book. Okay, I'm gonna say, there are things that I like about it. There are things that I don't like about it. And first and foremost, I'm gonna say, the audiobook is like 13 hours, I think. It took me a full week 
to listen to it because even though it was 13 hours and even though I've listened to audiobooks that were longer like 18 19 hours this audiobook this book in general felt so long <laughs> I feel like I've lived lifetimes reading it it was so 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 much and part of that is because there is so much exposition there's a lot of world building that is just like inherently a part of the story which I can understand that as we recognize that the publishing world is heavily dominated by a certain demographic of people that may or may not be familiar with Chinese mythology, they have to add a certain level of this world building mechanic. They have to explain a lot of the mythology that's behind the story because if you don't get it, you're not gonna complete the story. You're not gonna like follow through with it. So I understand why there is an inherent pressure to make sure everything is well explained. And trust me, I do not know a lot about Chinese mythology. I learned a lot after reading this book and another book that I'm going to review later on. I understand why they had to do it that way, but it it's just a lot, you know? And I think part of the reason why it was so hard for me to get through it is because the world building is primarily delivered through narration. It's not delivered through dialogue or action or anything like that. It's literally just Xingyin telling you as the reader important things you need to know. And personally, like my personal style, what I really like in books and what I gravitate towards is dialogue because I really like, I think it grounds you in a character as well as it doesn't feel exposition heavy. It doesn't feel like it's taking a long time to get through the actual plot. This book, however, as I was reading it, because so much of the world building is delivered through narration, I was like, this is taking forever. When are we going to get to the next point in the story? They had me very like hooked right at the beginning. I was like, okay, you know, they immediately drop us in where, you know, she's leaving home and you're like, okay, who are we dealing with right now? What is happening? Especially because like, I was really intrigued because at the beginning you get a lot of narration from Xingyin, but you don't really know her too much as a character. The only thing you really know about her is just based on that she like disobeyed her mother's rules. But other than that, you don't know too much about her. So when we started the story, I thought we were going to be struggling because this is a girl that has not had a lot of genuine, I'm not gonna say human interaction because they're not technically human, but she hasn't had interaction with other people. So I was interested to see how she was going to navigate this new world by herself, but then she didn't struggle at all. <laughs> That's the one thing I, I didn't like about her character too much. I really would have liked if we kind of explored more of this aspect of her where, again, as I mentioned, she hasn't interacted with anyone other than her mother and Pinga, but she hasn't interacted with anyone that is of her age range or like, you know, different aspects of society like, you know, superiority, uh, power imbalances, things of that nature. She hasn't had any kind of interaction with those aspects of society. So having her thrown into this world where she just kind of has to like pretend to be a normal person, I thought we were gonna get a really interesting look into her character and kind of see her struggle as she's grappling with these things and the differences between her life on the moon versus the new life she has to make for herself. But it's really not, like it's kind of, push to the side. We don't really inspect it a lot. She's just kind of like, yeah. <laughs> Beef number one is that the main point of Xing Yin's like adventures, what she's doing in this book, is propelled by the fact that she wants to free her mother from her imprisonment. But so many of her decisions don't make me feel like she was trying to free her mother. And let me tell you why. Like one of the main big plot points in this book is that she essentially gets something like an apprenticeship. She gets to train alongside the prince of the celestial realm. His name is Li Wei. So she gets this opportunity to essentially learn how to use magic and just be his companion at the royal palace. When she talks about why she wants to do it, her main motivation is just so that she can learn how to use magic but she never says it in a way as though like, oh, I need to learn how to use my magic so I can learn how to free my mother. No, 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 no. She's very blatant and explicit about like this selfish desire 
to learn how to use her own magic that she wasn't able to previously because her mother forbade it. And that's like a really big part of the story. So I feel like for her motivation to only be selfish when we're supposed to believe that she's doing everything in her power to try to free her mother is like, like those things don't go together, right? At this point, I'm just like, okay, well, why are, what are her motivations then? What, it, why is she doing all this? Why is she going on all these side quests? Because I feel like they're all side quests. It doesn't feel like she's making any real strides towards her goal until part three of the book. So this book is divided into three parts, part one, part two, part three, right? To first address the length and to then address like the, you know, being all over the place. I think part two needs to be like cut in half, part one cut in half, part three can stay the same, but we need to get rid of a solid chunk of this book to make it readable. And I say that because like, again, I feel like as I'm reading this book, I'm getting so distracted. Shingen is going on so many side quests that I forget what we're supposed to be working towards. So part one is, you know, when she leaves the moon, right? Okay. Um, she gets her little apprenticeship of some kind, you know, that's not the word that they use, but that's essentially what it is. Apprenticeship with the prince. They essentially start having a romance and then she finds out that he's uh, betrothed to this girl from the Phoenix Kingdom. And then she's like, oh, I'm heartbroken. I'm gonna go join the military now. That's part one. Part two is her going on all these military quests, Leeway getting jealous that she's getting close with the general and then her getting mysterious feelings for the general. And then she goes on a mission to save the abducted princess of the Phoenix Kingdom. She saves Leeway, they come back and she's awarded essentially like the Medal of Honor. The Crimson Lion Talisman is what it's called. So at the end of part two, she's awarded that talisman and whoever is awarded that talisman gets to ask a favor of the celestial emperor. That's part two. Part three is her saying, hey, free my mom. And he says, no. And she's like, okay, how about you give me the opportunity to win her freedom? And he says, okay, get these pearls from these dragons. And then she does that. And then, you know, end of book shenanigans. Part three is the only part of the book where she's actually making strides to free her mother, which is supposed to be her main objective. You're telling me I have to read 66% of the book to get there? That's a big ask. That's a really big ask. Were it not for my goal to read every book on my TBR list, hence the reason I created my YouTube channel, I would have DNF'd this. I would have absolutely just been like, this book is not for me. I just, I can't finish it. I would have never finished it, but I did because A, channel. B, um, my sister really liked it and I needed to figure out why. And C, because I just, I can't quit. I just, I don't give up on these things. I am stubborn to my core. I remember at some point literally asking them, I was like, convince me that this book is good. Convince me. Cause at this point, I don't feel like it is. And I think again, part of me is because I am reading these books from a content perspective. I'm thinking harder about them and I'm like really analyzing these aspects because I'm supposed to be analyzing them for a video versus just like, I'm sure if I just wanted to enjoy it, it would have been fine. If it was just for like a cute fun time, I would have been okay. But alas, <sighs> content. It's almost like Shingen kind of like forgets that that was her main goal because part of it is that there's like a second secondary plot that she has a romance between the celestial prince that is Leeway and the captain of the celestial army and that is Captain Wencher. I just feel like in general, because the book is so narration heavy and so world building heavy, I don't really feel close to any of the characters. And I read some like reviews after I finished the book just to like kind of see, because this is a national bestseller. There are a lot of reviews for this book on Goodreads and generally a lot of people liked it. I saw there's like three pages at the beginning of this book only dedicated to blurbs, like just things that people have said about the book. And I was like, whoa, I feel like this is gonna be controversial for me to say I don't like it. So I'm just like, okay, I had to know if I was alone in not liking it. 
but I don't think I was. And something that I saw in a review was like perfectly articulated how I felt about it, which was that the character, our main character, Shingen, doesn't really go through any kind of character arc. Her character remains like pretty flat personality wise. Her like only personality change or shift is in part two after um, she finds out that Li Wei is betrothed and she essentially like shuts off her emotions, but we never really get that feeling like they try to portray her as if she's like a cold unfeeling war hero just like like put me on the job and I'll do the job kind of person but she's never like that like they're just telling us like Shingen is really trying to sell to the reader that she doesn't feel emotion but absolutely not because anytime leeway comes into the story she like folds like a lawn chair like the girl is like she folds over and over again like she cannot resist this man if her life depended on it. Normally I would say valid, but also Li Wei is very flat as a character as well because ugh, I'm tired. I'm tired of books only selling male love interests by just being like, they're nice. I'm sorry, but don't disrespect me. My standards are a little higher than that. They should be rich and nice. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Yeah, like, like Li Wei is just like a nice person and treats her with like common decency and will occasionally buy her gifts. Like he's like, he's the kind of like boyfriend where he's like, oh, if he notices that she's looking at something in the shop, he'll be like, I'll buy that for you. Like he doesn't even think about it. He's just like, you looked at that item for longer than five seconds. It's going in your purse now. That's him, which is like, okay. But I have yet to see in this book, again, it's a duology, I don't know. In this book, there was never a point where I was like, I can absolutely understand why she's in love with Li Wei, other than just like proximity, just that he was there. And that's sad. He's just not very compelling as a love interest. I just don't understand why I'm supposed to be rooting for him this hard. He feels very like dime a dozen kind of love interest. And then the other love interest, which is Captain Wensher, he is, um, He's supposed to be like the bad boy, if you will. The only notes that I have is that he was like, he's like a very doting boyfriend. So he's like very hyper aware of like Shingen, her needs, emotionally, physically, whatever. He's, he's very worried about her constantly, which is like, okay, slightly better. I think I would have like rooted a lot more for Captain Wensher if it was more obvious that Shingen liked him. Because let me tell you, I kid you not, I could not make this up. She doesn't really acknowledge that she has any kinds of feelings for him until like halfway through part two. She has another friend in the military. Her name is Xu Xiao. And at one point she's like, oh, you and the captain are spending a lot of time together. And Shingen is like, yeah, I, I work with him. We're co-workers. And Xu Xiao is like, don't you think he's handsome? And literally just her saying that, Shingen is like, oh my God. I'm in love with you. Like, there's no transition. There's no build up to that realization. Nothing happens. They give us no crumbs. They give us a slap in the ass and tell us, yeah, Captain Wensher is your new love interest. Absolutely not. I personally can't get on board with that. I am all for like a slow burn. There was no burning before this, nothing. It was just generally in passing that he was just like a nice person and that he flirted with her in part one. But on Shingen's part, there is like no point in which like before that moment that she expressed at any point that she had some like romantic feelings for him. Not even like a passing like, oh, he's pretty handsome or like, oh my God, he's very like caring and he's very doting and oh my God, nothing, literally nothing. There's no buildup to their relationship. It's literally just, oh, Xu Xiao thinks he's handsome. He's incredibly handsome. Like literally like as if this girl like lasered on rose colored glasses for Shingen. And then all of a sudden she's like, oh yeah, Captain Wensher is the best among men. Like, no. No, absolutely not. I kid you not. Every single person, I'm not even gonna say man, I'm gonna say person, I'm gonna be broad with this. Every single person that Chingin comes in contact with falls in love with her. At some point I started making a list of every single person that flirts with her. So it was Prince Liwei, right? Captain Wensher, right? Uh, prince Yenshi, who is the prince of like the Southern Sea or something of that nature. They meet for all of like five seconds. Oh, Captain Wensher's brother also flirts with her. 
that's a whole separate thing. The governor, the like literally side character that shows up for a chapter and then dies in the same chapter, flirts with her before dying. Not a single man in this story was like, I like you platonically. No one, every single person had to flirt with her. I mean, even Xu Xiao was kind of flirting with her too. It's a little overkill. It's a bit much when she's not really likable as a person. Really, like she's like she's just a, a narrator. I don't know too much about her. Like she cares about her mom, yes. She has a general caring for other people, yes. She's a good archer, yes. I don't know, I don't know too much else about her personally. So in part three, and arguably like one of the most important aspects of the story is the presence of dragons, which aren't mentioned heavily until part three. Like in part three, she is supposed to go on a quest from the emperor where she's supposed to get pearls from the last four remaining dragons alive in existence. Before this point, the dragons are only ever mentioned in passing and they're mentioned like halfway through part two. For a rather important aspect of the story, you would think it would be mentioned early on with some kind of like inkling that that should be something that you remember as the reader. No. <laughs> with that, I also think that as a character, as a protagonist, things come a little too easily for Shingyan. Like she does not struggle. There's really nothing that kind of stands in her way. She accomplishes her goals very quickly. We never see her fail. We never see her fail in a way that's impactful rather. So when we start the story, she's struggling because she's employed at like the Lotus mansion or something of that nature. And she's a servant and people are picking on her and she's like, oh my God, I hate my life. I just need Pinga to come and save me so we can go to the Southern Sea as was promised but eventually she runs into who she doesn't know at the time, but it's it's leeway. And she's telling him like, oh my God, I hate my life, blah, 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 blah. I miss my family. Like they're having like a heart to heart. And then he's like, oh yeah, I'm having a competition to find like somebody that's supposed to like train alongside me. And he picks her in a like rigged, 100% rigged competition. It doesn't get more rigged than that. It doesn't get like produce 48 M net has nothing on the rigging of that competition. <laughs> then she starts learning magic and everything is coming very easily to her. She's like picking up on it very quickly. Like they, they try to tell us that she's struggling, but then it's like she picks up on things incredibly quickly. So it's like, where is the struggle? Is the struggle in the room with us? Then she becomes like the best archer ever. No build up to that. And then she like defeats a monster that the previous celestial army had not defeated in like months and had previous attempts to try and kill this one monster and they couldn't, like a whole army of people couldn't. And then she shows up and then all of a sudden they can. She manages to defeat this like scary flower lady that is holding both her and Li Wei hostage. Which in reality, there, there's like a whole fight sequence. Li Wei gets captured and they both have to like fight each other to the death or something. I cannot tell you how they escaped that alive. They explained it. They tried to tell me it didn't make a lick of sense. And then she goes on this quest to get the pearls and the dragons just give them to her in one chapter. She gets captured by Cam Captain Wensher who happens to also be the prince of the demon realm. Spoiler, shocking twist. And then she manages to escape because they happen to be growing a flower, a very specific flower that was mentioned at the very beginning of the book to have sleeping properties. And she manages to pick some up and she manages to drug him. So he falls asleep, steals the pearls and leaves. And then she frees her mother. Again, it like, it all happens throughout the book. There's like a flow to it, I guess, but it happens with like relatively no struggle. There's no point in which Shingen fails. Everything comes very easily to her. They try to tell us like, she's like, oh man, I really struggled to do this. But then like the struggle just never actually happens, which partly explains why she doesn't have any kind of character arc, because why does she need to develop if she's already the best? There's never any real motivation for her to change as a character because these things come so easily to her. And now for my biggest beef in this book. I'm not gonna lie, this was a book that I frequently 
had to go back, reread the chapters, listen to them again, because I just was not understanding. And part of that was where we were at. When the story begins and she falls like from a cloud, they travel on clouds. I was very confused on where she fell to because I thought she fell to earth. And I was like, oh my God, an immortal on earth? That's crazy, that's tea. No, she didn't fall to earth. She fell to the celestial realm. So she fell to this like other realm. So it's like the moon, realm of people and then the actual mortal earth with all us regular degular people but this like celestial realm that she finds herself in is for people that are immortal now they're not gods but they're immortals so let's focus on that typically when someone is immortal that means they don't die can can we agree on that is that is that the consensus right these characters die all the time. So you might have noticed when I like held up the book, I have all these tabs and all these tabs represent the times in which Xingyan says that she could have died or other people died. All these people that are supposed to be immortal. So first I can understand that immortal means a lot of different things. It's not necessarily that someone is like invulnerable because as we know with like Eurocentric mythology with vampires, vampires technically cannot die, right? They live forever, but they can be killed depending on which, you know, version, you know, typically wooden stake to the heart, sunlight, something of that nature, right? There is like a weakness inherently. They are immortal, but there is a way to kill them, but it's very specific. In this book, these people can not only die from like, you know, specific weapons killing them, they can die from drowning. Uh, they can die from falling from a large height. And they age. Typically, with the whole immortality and not dying parts, there's also the you don't age part of it. I told myself, maybe, maybe I'm just not understanding. Maybe because this is Chinese mythology. Maybe I'm just being ignorant. Maybe I just don't know. And you know, maybe immortality just means something different in Chinese mythology compared to what I have known in the media that I've consumed since growing up, right? So I looked it up. I looked it up. Celestial, which is, you know, what we talk about in this book. These are all celestial beings. There's like levels to immortality in Chinese mythology. And there is a level of immortality where they don't actually live forever and they can die. But it is the absolute bottom tier of the immortals. And it's because they don't gain their immortality through a normal means. And if they do something, whatever, like their lifespan can be taken from them. Celestial immortals are meant and thought to be the highest form of immortality below literal gods. My battery is dead. Let me, let me relax for a second. I'm calm, I'm calm. The reason I was so worked up about this whole immortality business is because it just confuses me a little bit on the stakes of the story. With them being immortal, I think that it's inherently more impactful when an immortal dies. Because, again, as I mentioned with my example with the vampires, when an immortal dies, it's because of something very specific, a specific event happening or a specific weapon that is used to kill them. And it's very notable when an immortal dies in a story because the preconceived notion that if you're immortal, that means that you cannot die, but it doesn't mean that you're invulnerable, which is an important distinction. So it has a lot of impact. It carries a lot of weight when an immortal does die in a story that has them. In this story, everyone is immortal and everyone dies very easily. It just leads me to question, like, what is the purpose of having them be immortal? I think it would have been an interesting story uh, if Shingen went down to the mortal realm or like simultaneously if she wasn't immortal. I think it would have been interesting if she took all this like adventure stuff in the mortal realm because obviously like she would essentially be invulnerable and all these people would be like, whoa, you're really good at all these things. Like it would, it would be an inherent difference and it would also add to the layer of tension because 
throughout the book she has to hide her identity as the daughter of the moon goddess but i think it would carry a lot more weight if she also hide had to hide her identity as an immortal and simultaneously if she was mortal in the story i think it would have been really interesting to like kind of see that perspective as she roams the world of immortals of celestials because they would essentially like think she is also immortal and then like whatever when they do their whole battles and stuff she's like actually worried that she could die and then they don't know if she can actually die i just think it kind of takes away from the story and takes away a little bit from from of the magic that they can die so easily even though they are supposed to be immortal which again this could very well be a stylistic choice this could very well be just something of like mythology specific to Chinese mythology that I just do not understand which I will acknowledge but I will say that as a reader it took me out of the story because again so much of the story is the world building so for this like glaring error for lack of a better term to come up so frequently for the whole beginning of the story to focus on the fact that they're immortal to then all of a sudden like they can literally die by falling off a cliff I am confused. I It takes me out of the story. I can't focus on the story because I'm over here thinking like, okay, I'm literally making lists of all the ways that these supposed immortals can die. There are things that I did like about this book. There are. There's a really good line from Li Wei. Hold on, where, where is it? It's kind of cute, it's kind of slay. So they're on like a cute little date, right? They go to the mortal realm. It's cute, it's fun, it's funky fresh. And then he essentially like confesses his love for her and she says, you love me? And he says, he, he delivers this, I'll give him this. He had a banger of a line. Let me tell you this. He says, after all our time together, did I have a choice? That was kind of a slay. That was definitely like, okay, yeah, he's kind of smooth. He's, he's got the riz just a little bit. I can understand that. I've been saying riz ironically, but now it's just like actually a part of my vocabulary, which is not fun. But let us not give Li Wei or Wen Shi any kind of props. They're not good love interests at all. Like it feels like I'm choosing between Aspen from the selection and Gale from the Hunger Games. Like. It's a lose-lose situation. For Li Wei, yeah, like whatever, he's a prince, right? Incredibly jealous. Like anytime a like another character, another male character looks at Xing Yin, he gets so unbelievably jealous. It's not cute, it's not romantic, it's a little possessive. Especially because of the fact he's literally betrothed, leading her on when he's like, I have to marry for my kingdom. Like, I just, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Pookie. Like, no. And then it was also funny because, and another reason why I was like, absolutely not, why would she pick Li Wei is because she's awarded the Crimson Lion Talisman, right? This person with all their audacity thinks that she's gonna use her one celestial favor to ask for the permission to marry him. As if her whole life revolves around marrying him i'll give him something his audacity is impressive like this person who has every kind of authority as the prince the future ruler of the celestial realm like he could very easily break off his like engagement and yet he wants his girlfriend to do it he wants his girlfriend who had to go to the army, literally put her life on the line, because she's not immortal, put her life on the line a million different times just to win this one talisman, just to have the slight chance that she could win it. And then once she does, to use her one, one celestial favor that they can't say no to, to ask for his hand in marriage. How can someone be so delusional? And then he gets mad at her when she doesn't use her favor that way. He's like, oh, I thought you were gonna ask to marry me. And she's like, no, he could have broken off his engagement at any point, which he does in the future. He tells his uh, betrothed, he's like, I can't do this anymore, so sorry. And she's like, eh, yeah, that's okay, it's fine. And it's not even an issue. So he could have done that at any point, but he doesn't. He wants her to show this like grand gesture of love, but he won't. You're joking. <laughs> and then it doesn't even get better with Wencher because she like, again, as I mentioned, she has no romantic feelings for this dude. And this is something she says when at some point, so they get back to the celestial kingdom, right? And he's like, I quit the army. And she's like, whoa, why did you quit 
the celestial army and he's like i have to go back home and he's like i want you to come with me and she's like why me and he's like because i love you and you're gonna marry me obviously like where have you been and then me as the reader i'm like whoa was the romantic tension in the room with us what what is happening what do you mean you're gonna move back to my home and marry me are you joking as i mentioned she gives no inclination that she actually likes this dude and then this is the quote we get and this is supposed to be romantic i stared into his strong handsome face something shifted in my chest i cared for him i know i did my dismay at his leaving was proof of that and was it not said that love would grow between well-matched minds over the years and months? We had eternity before us. Which maybe to the, you know, general reader, just someone, you know, reading for funsies, you, you might not think too much about that. She's convincing herself that over time, she will love him. That right now she just cares for him, you know, you know, you know. She doesn't want anything bad to happen to him, you know, she has like a general like caring personality for him, right? But she doesn't love him yet. But you know, who knows? In a few years, in a few months, whatever. Maybe, maybe she could. This is a red flag to say the least. Are you joking? I'm supposed to be rooting for these two characters when one of them has to convince herself that there's a chance eventually that she'll fall in love with him? I'm throwing up. What? And he's supposed to be a main love interest? I almost feel bad for him. If someone told me, imagine you're, like, you're at the fucking altar, right? You're about to get married to somebody and the wedding vows are like, you know, when I decided to like run away with you the very first time, I like, I didn't like you at all. And at first I was like, oh, you know, he's paying for the plane and like, I'm gonna be living for free. So, you know, maybe like over time I could learn to love this person. And I'm so glad I did. It only took about like, you know, four years and you know, preferably I don't like when you touch me or look at me or like show any affection to me. But I have learned to love you as long as you never go near me for the rest of our lives. That is the vibe we're getting right now with these two. I've seen more chemistry between a fork and my electrical outlet. And at this point, I'm going to test it. Overall, this book is very long. I don't like the love interests. I don't like the main character. Part three is pretty entertaining. I'll give them that. There's a lot that happens in part three. A lot of the action that I wanted throughout the whole book is shoved into part three. But it's pretty good. This book is definitely for a specific audience. I'm just not that audience. I think that I would have liked it a lot better if it was a little bit shorter. Um, I think there are good parts in it. Um, again, as I mentioned, part three is pretty good. It's pretty solid. For me to like sit through part one and part two just to get to the good part, which is part three, it, it's a big ask. I think there are some changes that I would have liked to see. A bigger character arc for Shang Yan specifically if we saw her fail. Because as, as I mentioned, like something that she says in the beginning is that, hold on, where's the quote? A lesson I should have learned long before. Because some things came easily to me, I grew impatient at those which did not. So she's acknowledging that she kind of like is almost a perfectionist. She really likes doing the things that she's good at and the things that she isn't good at. She just like is impatient and just kind of gives up. So I would have really liked to see for a character arc with her, for her to fail specifically in this new world with all these things that she's unfamiliar with, to see her fail so that she can overcome those things and appear on the other side so much better than she was when she started. I, I think that would have been really great for her character, but we just don't see that. Things just come too easily to her. Again, there are things that I liked about this book, but there are also a lot of things that I just, I couldn't get down with. A lot of the world building, the way that the exposition is delivered, the characters, the love interests, the length, the confusion about what immortal means in this world. I'm gonna have to give this like a three out of five. It really hurts my heart because I picked up this book. The cover is beautiful. The art on the inside is beautiful. I don't like the story. <laughs> I think the concept is really great. I just think the execution, it left something to be desired. I know this is a duology. I will not be reading the second book. I had my sister summarize it for me and I can confidently say it absolutely doesn't need to be a duology. You know, if Sulintan has other releases, I will definitely look at those. Again, this is a debut novel. This was her first novel. 
So I'm gonna give a little grace, okay? I support women's wrongs. Of course, a debut novel isn't gonna be like amazing no matter what, obviously it's like, it's your first go, okay? So I, I will definitely extend all of my grace because publishing a book is hard. Writing a book is hard. So this, this is definitely not a reflection of her as an author and it's not a reflection of her work to come in the future. This just definitely wasn't my cup of tea and that's okay. I finished it, I, I persevered, everything's fine. But that being said, yes, that was Daughter of the Moon Goddess by Su Lin Tan. Um, please let me know. Did you read this book? Have you heard of it? Do you like it? Do you agree with the things I said? Do you disagree? Let me know in the comments below. Please leave a like, subscribe. My mother reminded me to tell everyone to subscribe to the channel. Be sure to follow Su Lin Tan on Instagram. If I find her Instagram handle, I'll put it here. I will also include the cover artist if I find out who they are. I'll put them right about here so you can go send your support, send your love. As I mentioned, this sweater is from Doctors Without Borders. So if you would like to make a donation, if you wanna get this sweater specifically, all you have to do is make a monthly donation of $25 or more. There is a specific link that you have to follow so that you can order this sweatshirt. I will try to provide it if I can add links. I don't know if I can. It's really comfy. I'm normally very particular about my crew necks. I really like this one. And of course, all that money is going to a really great cause. They're providing a lot of medical aid and effort in countries like uh, Sudan, Congo, in Gaza. So that's really great work. If you want to, please donate. If not, be sure to follow their Instagram page, share their graphics, just, you know, get involved at least in the conversation if you can't get involved financially. Be sure to also follow me on my social media at listen to Kristen on TikTok and Instagram. Ooh, I almost forgot about our induction ceremony, so let me do that. You see this little guy? You might recognize him from my celebration video. So I thought I'd add him to my shelf. What, what do you gotta say to the crowd, baby shark? He's camera shy, it's okay. Ooh, don't put it upside down, that would really suck. Here it is. Ew. All right, I have now officially added Daughter of the Moon Goddess to my library. And with that, that's the end of the video. Thank you again so much for watching. Uh, stay tuned for the next video, which I will be reviewing. Let me grab it for you. The next book that I will be reviewing is Song of the Six Realms by Judy Island. This book is signed and has sprayed edges. Oh my God. And with that, we're done. Bye-bye.